Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Ben the Bane Davis here with serial entrepreneur, MMA promoter, and overall disruptor. At 35 years young, the full-time family man and perpetual problem solver has made nothing but waves in the last 15 years, both in over the dozen successful businesses, but also within the mixed martial arts sphere. He is Harrison Rogers. Harrison, how are you doing? Good, man. Thanks so much. I know uh, we already spoke and we're able to get, you know, 30,000 foot view, but now we've been a couple weeks together. And so I'm excited to dive in deeper. 100%, man. Now let's kick it off with UFO one, such a great venue down there at Bell Park. And you really filled it out with the meet and greets beforehand and the overall production value. I'm not going to lie. Very impressive. I've seen some, you know, regional shows and, and uh, UFO one seemed to cut above the rest. How did you feel at the event overall? Yeah, obviously being one of the chefs in the kitchen, you <clears throat> you see some of the mistakes that go into, you know, the production. But I think for the audience and the fans and the people who attended didn't didn't you know, they felt like they it was perfect. So that's what I care most about. But obviously there's things that we can learn from and move forward even better with. But like you said, for regional promotions, we never want to be thought of as a regional promotion. Yeah. Uh, there were a lot of comebacks, I felt. You know, the hometown guys, they didn't have as much success as maybe many anticipated. Did you expect the, uh, you know, the back and forth momentum swings of the event? I couldn't have expected the majority of those fight outcomes. Even the ones who did win that we thought maybe would win, the way they won was unexpected. You know, people coming back from bloodied and almost, you know, <laughs> one foot out the, the cage to then winning by, you know... Um, knockouts or throwing up crazy submissions it it was a blast to watch and what's so fun about this league is i feel like all the fighters because everybody's a shareholder everybody's a, a part owner in it there's a different type of support that everybody has for everybody there's not like a this outcast fighter everybody hates and so everybody's like rooting for him to lose it's kind of like man everybody's putting on an incredible show giving it their all but we all love each, you know, we all love each other as weird as that sounds or as cheesy as that sounds, but it, it's different. And I love it. I think, I think the whole industry is changing. I think, you know, the term would be united as it is in the name. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and I was curious, do you think that the amenities, the medical coverage, the insurance, do you believe that that may be spurred on the fighters in terms of their intensity and, and willingness to go out there and leave it in the cage? Man, I hope so already. If it, if it's already affecting people at a subconscious level like that, then uh, amazing and um but i know it will get there and that will be a factor um going forward but i know post fights you know some of our hometown fighters who had pretty intense injuries are singing its praises be like yeah i know that this injury happened from the fight which is covered by the events insurance but who knows what additional ongoing uh coverage is going to be needed and they are fully covered you know and they're to for them to not have that stress we actually have a um interview with dan huber later today that we're going to go visit him at his gym as he's getting you know his his feet under under him again and see what his next plans are he's just like dude whatever the next second opinion surgery all these other things he's like i don't really care to worry if it's gonna not be claimed under this event's um, injury. He's fully covered. So whether that was a reason they left it all out in the cage or not, I think it's going to be going forward. And 48 fighters under contract so far that have those benefits. How important is it to kind of be set up for success? I mean, a lot of promotions maybe would have been signing progressively, but you guys are kicking it off with 48. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. You know, some fighters, understandably being a new promotion are hesitant to go full exclusive or you know kind of all eggs in one basket and I don't blame them you know let us prove ourselves over time but the ones who are exclusive and signed to us they are fully insured fully um, integrated in our benefits now I uh you know, one of the things I think was uh, interesting, and we spoke about this briefly, was the court of public opinion. You know, you felt like maybe the masses weren't necessarily on your side with some of the criticism that they levied against the UFL. Outside of just putting on successful events and delivering on the promises, what other ways do you think that you can rally that support from the mixed martial arts fans? Man, if I can solve that answer or answer <laughs> that question, I will be doing something right, because that is the question. You know, it's... um. 
I love it. Now, it was very star-studded as well at UFL 1. Guys like Chris Angel, Ish Wainwright, and more being in attendance down there in Mesa. What was the importance of bringing in these larger names and these celebrities? I mean, until we... It kind of piggybacks off of that support. You know, how do we get the audience and fans to start giving support? And it's got to be credibility. People who they do already trust or, you know, have that celebrity status that are giving their time to come and see what we're doing over here. I think that's the only way we're going to win over the MMA audience who are understandably pro UFC. Like that UFC is our you know, pioneer who we've all followed and we have all the trust in their process, their talent, their um, scouting and destination for those fighters. So for any previous legend of UFC or other big promotions to come and really show support to our league and what we're doing. I mean, yeah, we had Ish Wayne Wright, Chris Angel, and some other really cool celebs and, and athletes of other sports. We had a lot of UFC vets there. You know, we had Benson Henderson and Jared Cannonier and uh, I feel bad if I'm not going to name everybody because it was it, the MMA lab by itself is just stacked. And, and so that is where I think we are going to get the credibility to these fans. It says, look, they're not just a guy who wants to be a Dana White. You know what I mean? Who wants to watch, who wants to follow me around and be that guy? The, they're kind of saying, look, we're paying attention. We have our own fighters going to this promotion that we're supporting because we see that they have a future there that's paramount and and, and crucial right now at these early stages so yeah, that transit of property i trust this you should trust this as well certainly understandable i do have to dig into that where the hell did chris angel come from because that's <laughs> that's a very unique guy yeah he, i wouldn't be shocked <laughs> he 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 is a unknowingly martial art loving guy um, he and Frank have been friends, Frank Mir have been friends for a long time, but I don't know if it's been super recent, but it's been recent that I've seen how much Frank has been training Chris Angel. Like he, I think Chris Angel is going to be Frank's first black belt of his Mir Jitsu school. And, uh, it's impressive. I'm like Chris Angel, who's probably one of the busiest guys I can think of, not only with his uh, Las Vegas show, but everything else he's doing, he gives two to three hours a day, multiple days a week to, to commit to his martial art, um, trainings. I'm like, I don't have an excuse anymore. Yeah. I I'm like, <laughs> Oh, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to do that. Okay. Well, if Chris Angel can give that amount of time, you're like, I guess I, I got to get back. Yeah. I got to give it some, it follows that trend as well of like celebrities or, or really notable individuals who you wouldn't think have a combat sports interest. Guys like Anthony Bourdain, who then, you know, you see him rolling in the geese. It's just like, it's quite funny in that realm, but I do want to shift it to the ish Wayne, right? Talking about this ultimate goal to buy the Phoenix suns. I know it was initially 35. We've kicked it back to 38. Where does this stem from? It stemmed from probably similar to why I love starting the MMA. I know that I would never be a star NBA player. <laughs> so if I can't be a part of them on the court, I would love to at least participate um, as an owner and hopefully help get the Phoenix Suns to that championship that they were so close to in the finals two years ago. You know, that was so close. But um, honestly, it started out just mainly because I, I think I said it once, knowing that I wouldn't ever be able to play for them. I said it to like a friend or a family member. And I was like, well, I'm just going to own them then. And kind of <laughs> and kind of getting that, it opened my eyes to realizing how um, competitive I am or maybe how you doubt me, yeah. you know? I, and I hate saying, because I don't want to sound arrogant or douchey, but at a young age, I started realizing that I like people doubting what I can do and can't do. And um, lately, people have started to not doubt as much as I am used to. And so I'm like, wait, don't have that much faith. Don't yeah. have that much faith in me. I don't know if I can do that yet. I, you know, so it's kind of a weird change, but, um, from a young age, I was like, okay, well that sounds like it is a far reaching goal that people don't think I can do. That is my statement. I'm going to do that. And I love the sport of basketball. I love the NBA. I love the Phoenix suns, you know, growing up watching my dad and, and being 
in love with the Charles Barkley era and then, of course, the Nash era. Um, that was just kind of the goal. But now the United Fight League is kind of really taking the forefront of that goal of being like, maybe instead of owning the Phoenix Suns, I own the NBA. Of <laughs> but mixed of, martial of arts. MMA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, especially since the Suns just got bought by – a fan now one of the other motivating factors of me to buy the suns was that if i felt like the previous owner was a businessman first a bank he was a banker and so he was kind of running the the team from a bottom line point of view of you know this isn't very you kind of have to be a fan first to yeah. be an owner of that you you know you're not buying that to make money well yeah. he he actually did make a lot of money everything's optimized but if everything's optimized maybe it's not the best you know product for the team yeah you got, you're going to lose money in, on this type of investment. You have to be a fan first. And this new owner has shown that, you know, he's put a lot of money already into a Kevin Durant deal. He's taking a huge gamble on kind of a short game with, you know, a KD, uh, Chris Paul, short term hope for a, of championship because now we've given away first round picks we've given we've given away young talent like Mikel Bridges and Cam Johnson that if you weren't serious about trying to get a championship in the near future you kind of just shot yourself in the it's foot. It's a big swing yeah yeah <laughs> so I love it I love that it shows that he's a fan first and then it allows me to be like okay well somebody's already the white knight or the the, the knight coming in on the white horse to save the Suns I'm not able to do that, so I might as well focus on what I might be able to be a, a shining knight on a white horse to come save. And so far, the MMA League is right for that person to come in and, and save the day on some of these really important issues. It's grand, grand slams or strikeouts, I feel, right? No, no in between. Uh, I did I did want to stay on the NBA, though, because you, know, you mentioned the Barkley era. I was curious, what are some of your favorite Suns teams and players, and also some of the best memories from Sweet A32 over the years? Oh, man, good. How did you know the Sweet even? That's beautiful. Um, the best memories, obviously, you know, the, the Barkley era where – that's where kind of the nostalgic, the nostalgia happened with, with my dad and kind of just learning to love sports as a young guy and enjoying that with my dad. Um, it kind of then just maintained that level of interest until uh, 2008 time frame with, you know, 2004 to 2008? I can't remember, the Steve Nash era. And then it just, and I was like, you know, when, uh, yeah, 2004, when uh, Colangelo sold to Sarber, I was like, I want to be next. I want to, I want that to be a part of that next Paton because, you know, Colangelo, everybody loved. He was an incredible owner. He built it up to that point of that Nash era. And then when it was turned over, obviously I was a fan loving what was happening. But then to see how management and ownership can kind of, lose yeah. the dynasty potential is when I started being like, okay, somebody with a fan first that also is business savvy and, and negotiatively, man, I make up words, <laughs> you know, is good at negotiations that are win win for everybody and not just kind of a win for one person or one party. Yeah. yeah. Old school mentality. I was like, I can, I can recover the sons uh, from this, old school mentality yeah. um and i don't mean to harp on he's going through a lot of beat ups in, in, you know without me so i should lay off but that's kind of how it developed it just magnified over this long term kind of crappy period of watching yeah. something that you loved as a kid get kind of molded and manipulated yeah, yeah. it's like i was like we we're so good how does we go through this drought for so long but yeah, it's been a weird year now with this with this sale happening and with me focusing on a new big vision. Um, I haven't really found out if I've switched fully to not wanting the Suns anymore. So we could kick it back to 40 maybe, 42? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For, well, I, the com competitor in me needs to, if I'm going to do it, do it before 42 because Mark, Matt, Mark? Cuban. No, uh, well, Mark Cuban was previously the youngest, but now th I think, um, 
who's the one that just bought the Suns? I can't ever pronounce his last name correctly, but I'm pretty sure it's M- Matt. He was 42 when he bought it. And so I'm kind of like, ooh, that bar, that record is still right there. It gives me seven years. Do it in six. Here we go. Let's do it in six. Yeah. <laughs> to change the gears. Challenge accepted. To change the gears back to the UFL, I, I really feel, and it's something I expressed to you, the unique wrinkles in the marketing, uh, specifically with American-made MMA. Where did the idea for the reality TV show come from? Because I don't see other promotions putting in that legwork uh, in terms of marketing that you guys have done. It is a lot of legwork and not a lot of result or, or benefit yet. But honestly, it's not for that specifically. I think what we're doing is going to be looked back in 15 years as like, wow, I kind of want to have a documentary about it, you know, of the, of the buildup. And, you know, we kind of keep going back and forth of what the reality show's storyline is. What, what are we going to be including in the shows? Are people going to care more about the development of the league? Are they going to care more about the individual fighters so that we can promote the fighters for the upcoming events? we're kind of all over the map, uh, you know, uh, and so we're kind of just doing it all. We're kind of yeah. saying, well, those that are interested in, in watching us build the league, we're going to have nuggets of that for those that f- want to fall in love with our talent pool that are up and coming fighters um, to follow their journey to, through the UFL. We got to make sure we keep those nuggets in there. Um, but it's really fun. You know, a lot of my crew here uh, that are in the production team, we're evolving and we're figuring out what stories are the funnest to tell, what might be more for us just to keep it for our memories. In the, yeah, you know? in the bank, you know? Yeah, yeah. in the bank for our, when we do our documentary of all the stresses and chaos that happens um, building something like this. Um, but then ultimately, we do hope it is a valuable content that is worth money as well because, you know, you got to pay the bills. Absolutely. So, there has to be some return. yeah. But, Right now, we're not banking on it being a huge revenue producing asset, but maybe it will be. Which I think is someone with such a strong venture capital background, you understand, in the startup process, we're going to be in the red for a bit, you know. Yeah. It's- <laughs> Got to be comfortable in the red for a while, just... Hopefully not forever. And I feel the difficulty in catering to all audiences gets increasingly harder with the 100% unscripted nature of the show. I was curious, we talked a little bit about it, but what have been some of the biggest swings and misses so far, you would say? I think in the reality show itself, you mean? Um, The raw non-scripted is difficult because you literally have to have a camera on you 24 seven because you never know when you're going to get those dramatic calls or when you're going to have to talk people off ledges or convince somebody this is worthwhile. And and so it's, it's not feasible to have a camera on you 24 seven, but then when you have your scheduled times to record, um, sometimes it's not dramatic and it's not fun and you, but then you have to script things and rehearse and it's kind of like, then it's not authentic and it's not really how it went down. It, that's been our biggest swing and misses is thinking we can do it a certain way and then it not really being good content. And that's where I was kind of saying is, as we're getting our, our bearings, seeing what stories are worth telling that our audience wants to hear, whether they want to see how it's, a developed league or the fighters once we know exactly how to package those types of stories to the different audiences we will be able to build our processes find the demand create the supply you know yeah. basic yeah. economics yeah. basic economics <laughs> um, now we've got it in front of us and I, I believe I asked about it but to reiterate where did F3 come from because it's such a departure from I would say the conventional background that you have and um, I was curious what, what are the difficulties about educating yourself on the energy drink market yeah, you know, ironically, it's so different than what my previous companies were. Um, but in a sense, like, like so for everybody, my previous businesses ranged from um, outpatient clinics for different types of therapy, speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy, but a lot uh, around mental health with uh, individuals with special needs, different cognitive disabilities, uh, ranging from private schools for students with autism to you know, uh, addiction recovery and different, just a lot of different things. And through that decade of, of being in that industry, there are obviously medications, pharmaceuticals that, that are imperative, um, 
for people, but there are natural ingredients as well that can be taken as supplements or whatnot that a lot of my, um, audience in that industry have had good success with, you know, whether it's battling depression, anxieties, um, you, you know, it gets controversial when you start talking about, oh, you can't cure, you know, pretty significant, uh, diagnoses with, with natural ingredients, but people ranging on a variety of severity of different, uh, diagnoses, diagnoses, um, have benefits when taking supplements. And so if we can have some of those supplements in a drink, it got kind of exciting. The problem is, is those ingredients taste like crap. I mean, so <laughs> it, you know, bitter and, you know, gross. And so we could make a drink that could potentially provide those benefits that people might need to choke down, you know, yeah. close your nose and just <laughs> take shots. But it over several trial and errors uh, back and forth with different samples. I couldn't be more proud of this drink, not only because of the benefits, but it tastes good. I'm not embarrassed for people to try it and be like, eh? you know, it's like, please try this. And then, you know, cause you can sell something once and then it has to sell itself over and over and over again. So that was kind of one world's viewpoint of an, a drink. And then now going to this whole MMA world, c combative sports and talking with people who, you know, I've never had to go out and do the sponsorship business, you know, and say, hey, here's how many eyes we're going to have on this content and blah, 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 blah. But noticing a lot of different, a lot of sponsors for this type of sport or, you know, audience, energy drinks are a big sponsor, you know, Monster, Red Bull, uh, bang all these things. And so at first when I was like, Hey, I need to get a sponsor for in, in an energy drink. It's just so perfect for our audience going and talking to some of these people. It became very apparent that we're not going to get the check written to us that I feel like we deserve yet. Mm -hmm. Understandably, they don't know us. And they're like, how many eyes do you have on us? Oh, these, these views and engagements are piddles compared to, you know, big promotions. So we're just not going to write a big check. I wouldn't either if I was them yet. We're an unknown, um, you know, promotion. So I'm like, this could be the time <laughs> where not only can I create a drink that can benefit my previous audience, our, our fighters are one of the biggest consumers of hopefully healthy things, but also caffeinated things. Um, that if we can create a drink that I can benefit both audiences with and then be our own sponsor, I know the value that our league is going to have view wise, uh, engagement wise. So I would hate for Bang or Monster or Red Bull to get the benefit of being a sponsor for pennies on the dollar and us raise their value when we can do it ourselves. Right. And we have moved mountains and created miracles to produce something so quickly um especially something that is so i think industry changing of its own i mean we're already getting retailers calling us that are begging for us to get it in there and so we're producing like crazy you should see some of our warehouses it's just like pallets. oh just yeah. pallets and pallets <laughs> and pallets and and then realizing that we have to do artwork changes because some of the retailers don't want fight in uh you know their stores and and we, it, it's awesome. So it's taking off on its own. That is, it's completely owned by the United Fight League. So the shareholders, the fighters, the everybody involved, have direct acts like um, advantage for its success. And so they become the biggest cheerleaders of the drink. They become the biggest cheerleaders of the league. But these bad boys are what is going to provide the revenue to offer bigger contracts, get bigger, bigger names and bigger fighters, getting them to come over from other promotions. And it's in everybody's best interest to perpetually buy our own stuff that benefit us. But that was one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about was kind of the overarching theme of intersecting businesses. And it extends outside of mixed martial arts. I've seen with that hybrid systems integrating with Lexington Life Academy, you know, it's all complementary and unified. Where does that knack come from because it all clicks i know it's 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 pretty fortuitous that 
things have aligned this way because I definitely didn't learn it in school. Yeah. I'm a high school dropout. Yeah. Dropout, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so I, I definitely don't want to dust off my shoulder saying, oh, this is this is genius Harrison. It has been just through experiences of building my other businesses that have seemed to work when you can find ancillary businesses that not only benefit off of each other, they actually um, promote each other and they um, address needs of the other. I know you were talking about the liability insurance. You're like, well, I'll just start an insurance company. You know, and like, it's crazy that um, this has been kind of an eye opener because business owners who have been in business, especially venture capitalists that have reached out over the years are kind of like mind blown of some of these structures that I've set up. And I'm like, I'm not smarter than anybody. How has this not been put together with a, you know, a, a, for example, I was going to acquire a, uh, PN, I want to say PNL, but a PNC property and casualty, uh, insurance carrier that did, um, kind of high risk drivers and whatnot. And then I'm like, well, all these different businesses that you can have um, owned by this same thing that you're can make sure that your risk is less by owning this different. I don't want to give away too many of that. Secret. That's actually a business deal. It's in the works. Um, <laughs> they were kind of like, wow, it, it just seems like a lot of businessmen are very much um, encouraged to focus on one industry and dominate it. And that probably does have a lot of historical data to being successful. I, and so I don't want to act like, oh, I'm better, I'm smarter than a Harvard business professor or whatever. Because they say, you know, build, build deep instead of build wide and shallow. For some reason, I have had more success at building wide that operate together and th that allows them to go deep and so um and it kind of helps my add yeah i was gonna <laughs> say it, the it, diversity it, it would negate burnout because yeah. you're like i'm not stuck 30 years doing the same thing and um you know we'll, we'll talk about the american education system because i know that you've got your own comments on that but like like you said high school dropout at age 17 you didn't go through eight more years of schooling after that point or whatever and so i feel like the perspective that you have is just different you know what i mean um, but I wanted to, to, to switch it back to the room that we're in right now, actually, which I believe is where the HJR experiment is filmed. Uh, I'm very impressed with the quality of the, the, the production, you know, and I've always been saying that to you, but like, it is impressive. What are the long-term goals for that? Uh, for HJR in general experiment? Yeah. It is kind of like the reality show in the sense where it's meant to just kind of follow along and give audience a back behind the scenes type access to what we're doing because we have not only um, fighters and events that are coming that are fun to watch we have so many partners that are excited to come on like Chris Angel you know he's he has so many ideas that he would like to bring so let's get him on a podcast let's talk more in depth that is hard to get that conversation in a reality show you know Ish Wayne Wright from the NBA um, perspective I want to hear his background in it. Maybe there's synergies between having energy drinks. Maybe that's a way I can get my foot in the door in the Phoenix <laughs> Suns, you know? And there's just, I love the podcast and the interview type conversations because you can, like I was just saying, I'm just word vomiting all over. I don't have to be very um, prepared and have like the, the memorized notes. Yeah. Worry, worry that on a reality show, you're losing people's interest like that. If you're taking a second to think about your answers, you know? Podcasts are kind of the solution for my type of conversation where I do a lot of like, hmm, I do it. And if you do that on any other type of format, yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. <laughs> you're, you lost your audience. So I think the podcast will just always be there um, for that benefit because I love to get in deep with guests, but uh, I don't really have an exit plan for that. Which is probably a good thing, right? That's, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. maybe it'll fizzle out, but maybe maybe it won't. Maybe I'll start doing, uh, you know, podcasts with, I, me and Rampage plan to do movies after we kind of mic drop in the MMA world and turn it over to a board of directors and a president at that time, which I plan only to be three, four, five years from now. 
um, I don't want to be a day in white forever. Like, uh, and so it'd be really cool to then have our podcast be more Chris Pratt or, um, the Joe Rogan esque. Yes. Oh my gosh. Generalized. Yeah. He, that is, I mean, I'm sure that's every podcaster's dream, yeah. but to be able to have a daily agenda of meeting with incredibly experienced, smart, um, from a variety of aspects of the world, just conversing with them. That's how I learn. I don't, yeah. I don't learn in a school classroom. So I, if I had a Jordan Peterson or, a, um, I, he's Elon Musk or, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, I can have those deep conversations one-on-one -on -one with these people and other people can benefit from it. That's, that'd be a dream. And that would work with the schedule. You and Rampage are filming a team too. I mean, that's, exactly. <laughs> exactly. um, I do want to dig into the school though, because I thought that this was really interesting, uh, and almost a homegrown underdog type story. You began building a carpet cleaning business your junior year, then went to trading currencies on the foreign exchange market. And from there, that's where Lexington Life Academy, LCI Realty were born and then enveloped under HJR Global. Tell me about the insanity of your late teens and early 20s. Oh man, it was difficult to get a date, that's for sure. <laughs> Who, you know, not a lot of females in my circles um, are very attracted to a high school dropout and yeah. uh, definitely driving around a smelly van because that was my only <laughs> mode of transportation was my work van um, that smelled terrible because it was full of people's dirty carpets. Um, <laughs> But it was so fun, you know, I talked to a lot of business colleagues that have made it in their businesses and they're kind of coasting now. They're very comfortable. They love it. But we all talk about kind of missing that grind, that journey, that unknown. Is this going to be worth it? Is it not going to be worth it? And so looking back at those times, even though it was very unrewarding financially for the most like relative it was fun as crap grinding and panicking. Like, is this client going to be happy? Are they going to give me a terrible review? Are they going to be repeat? Oh shoot. I just broke, you know, my wand mid, mid, uh, uh, mid cleaning. And it's, it's completely damp everywhere. I can't suck it. You know, just like weird things that don't matter. But you look back on me and I'm like, Oh, I got through that. That was, that was kind of fun at the time. It's not fun. Yeah. So I don't want to go through this journey and look back and be like, oh, I didn't enjoy that at the time. You know, in the office when Toby, or is it Toby? No, it's, um, oh, is it Ed Helms where he's like, you don't want to know the good, the good old days before. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish people would tell me that the good old days were the good old days before, before they ended. Yeah. 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 And, I, and that hit so deep because I was like, I do look back at some of my most stressful times and be like, those were the good old days. And so I need to make sure that I'm not doing that in the future and being able to be like, oh no, those were the good old days, but I knew they were the good old days. Yeah. So doing better at being present um, now, especially five kids. You know. That's a lot. I saw from the 2016 to the 2020, uh, you know, keeping up, you added yeah, to the family. The family. Oh, dude, <laughs> we kept adding. Uh, and just kept adding. So yeah, between 20, 2010, when my first was born to 2019, we had five kiddos and that went by so fast. I remember our first one being due in a week and being like, I'm going to have a kid in a week. What is she going to be like? What is, you know, uh, am I going to be ready as a dad now, 13 years later? And I'm like, I don't want to do that again. I don't, I don't, I don't want to blink and feel like I missed out. So there is a fine juggling of loving the grind of growing yeah. businesses, making sure that you're doing all, everything you can to put in the work needed to make a, a venture succeed, but miss out on the experience, the balance of the personal life and the work life. Yeah, so absolutely. Enjoying the present, which is so hard for people like me to do. What has been the biggest takeaway from being a father over the last 13 or so years? Ooh, I've not been asked that. Honestly, I think it's probably what we were just talking about is learning to be present when you totally have everything else going on. Yeah. yeah. Because even like yesterday, I, I, my daughter was having some issues in class and I went to go meet with the teacher and I realized that was the first time I met with her teacher 
um, that whole year. And I'm like, I, I'm not involved in their schools. I, I don't know how they're doing in their grades. And so just the epiphany of realizing how quickly you can get left behind in their lives without, without constant moderation yeah. of like, yeah, keep without even it being because of bad things. Like a lot of people think a neglected, a neglected child is because the parents don't care or they, you know, don't really love effect. their kid. Yeah. yeah. I love my kids to death, but it happens so quickly that you're like, holy crap, a whole semester has gone by. And I don't even know who her teachers are and all these. Are. So that was kind of an eye opener is that unfortunately you can't take any breaks. You can't, yeah. you can't let your brain go on idle and just kind of coast for a while. Otherwise you've missed business growth. You've missed kid experiences. You missed, um, spousal duties, you know, whatever it is, uh, that's kind of been my, um, the answer to how you phrased the question. I can't remember. Eye opener, your takeaway. Takeaway. Yeah. Yeah, It's just learning how to not coast and be idle. Cause when I get home sometimes now I have these cool mood drinks that help just kind of take away the anxiety, anxious of the next day. If you can kind of just chill out at night and enjoy what you've built with your family, what you, you know, that is going to be a game changer for, for me and a lot of my colleagues. And, you know, talking about enjoying things, your first job was, uh, you know, wearing a pig costume for a barbecue restaurant, waving at cars in the middle of the summer in Arizona. Arizona. That must have sucked. Oh, <laughs> I think I still have like a, I have this calic that they call it, but I think it's a permanent bald spot because that helmet you know, you're sweating. It has this thing that kind of catches your hair. And I just remember every day just pulling out chunks because it anyway. So that is a forever reminder that you work hard so that you don't always have to work hard. Yeah. Because I remember thinking I'm probably going to die in this thing. And especially now <laughs> being an adult that I would never let not only my child, but any worker of mine be in a, yeah, I'm like, how did this get a, I mean, I legally we've gotten a little bit better. Are you, are you a fan of barbecue? You still a big BBQ guy? Oh yeah. yeah. I, I can, I can put down some, some barbecue. (laughs) Um, I was curious. Now you use the money from the sale of the carpet cleaning business to go on a church mission trip. Uh, first off, how was the trip? And second off, were you going on that mission with something in mind, like trying to figure out something, trying to grapple with shit? Yeah. You know, I um, grew up LDS in the Mormon church where I kind of knew always that I would have this two-year mission where I could learn a lot about the church. (laughs) So I put off learning about my church (laughs) until then because I'm like, why do I need to learn much about it now? You know, I thought, why do I need to study all of these things about my church and go through all this. I'm gonna have two years to dedicate solely to it. Um, so I'm pretty, I, I was pretty dang ignorant about my own church Believe, teachings, yeah. beliefs, <laughs> teaching, you know, just kind of going with, with the flow. I, I loved the community of the church. And then when I went, when I sold the carpet cleaning business to go on the mm-hmm. church mission, I w- I went to um, the missionary training center in Provo, Utah where you kind of go learn about your, you know, your teachings, you kind of build your own testimony. And if you're learning a new language, you learn the new language. And I was going Spanish speaking. I was called to uh, Philadelphia Spanish speaking. So, um, learn, learn Spanish and barely got my hands around all this stuff that I've been delaying learning about, you know, the old Testament, the new Testament, the, the book of Mormon, and right when I was called to report to Philadelphia, I actually had a heart attack. What? So I know it was, um, a, I guess, a birth defect that I never knew about until I got old enough to and, and sat in, in a sedentary life. You know, I was very active as a as a young guy. And then when you're in the missionary training center, all you do is eat, sit, study, sleep, eat, sleep. And so that. I don't know if it was because of that lifestyle or is because of all the monster and Red Bulls that I drank <laughs> leading up to it. Whatever it was, I I remember playing volleyball and going to serve it and then all of a sudden just like completely 
you know, losing complete um, consciousness because my heart was racing so much. You know, woke up in the hospital after having surgery. Um, they went and ablated extra electric pathways that was causing it to be Ill- ir- irregularly and pit- patched up whatever else needed to be healed and returned home to heal up and, and whatnot. And then after a little bit, met my wife and never, never looked back never and, and yeah, <laughs> never, never finished the mission. So I unfortunately still am very uneducated on the depths of our teachings, but I still love the values, the community, the structure that our church encourages. Um, and so I, I'm committed to, to that. And soon I'll be able to study more, hopefully. And, you know, I'm whenever, you get a break. whenever I get a break, because <laughs> I'm so interested in, in world religions and, and partnering with Frank Mir. I swear that guy is just like a Rolodex. I don't even know if that's the word. An, an encyc- yeah. encyc- encyclopedia of trivia, especially with world religions. And so kind of getting to dive in deep with him is fun. Do you think that was God saying, no, Harrison, you shouldn't go on the mission <laughs> right said now? That so many times. <laughs> I was like, maybe he um, was like, he was like, this guy doesn't speak Spanish well enough to yeah, get the job done. He doesn't know nearly enough about the church to go talk to anybody about it. Or I try to say also like, oh, no, I, I probably wouldn't have met my wife if I wouldn't have come back in right then. So um, either way, very grateful for that strike down, you know. I did. I had one follow up on the barbecue restaurant gig, and it was that if you could tell Pig Costume Harrison one thing, what would it be? Preferably while he's on the job in 110 while degree heat. <laughs> no. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely say, you know, take more water breaks. I, I swear. Maybe that's what caused the, the heart damage was, was so much. Uh, but maybe I'd say one of the things that I think is different about me now than was then is I really did care a lot about people's... Um, expectations of me or their parameters of reality and, and whatnot. And that's fine. And I actually, in a good, some ways helped me when I would feel motivated by their skepticism or challenged by their, you can't do that. But I also on the flip side believed a lot of the things for too long that like, Oh, I'm not ready to do this. I'm not ready to do that. Um, I have to wait for approval by this person before I can even, you know, blah, 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 blah. I hate, do you ever, do you ever now look back and be like, man, if I would have just tried a little bit harder in that eighth grade basketball tryout, what was I afraid of? If I would have just freaking give it everything I had right then I would have made the team. And I would like so many different things. I I was always like, I was always the nice guy. Like I was always, um, and I'm still the nice. I always want to be the nice guy, but I remember in football being like, I don't want to tackle him too hard, you know, because <laughs> there's an edge. Yeah. That's there's that killer instinct. I didn't have edge, that. I always wanted to be, Hey, he's going to not like me in school. If I tackle, tackle him too hard yeah. here and I don't want to jeopardize the relationship in school. So I never was able to fully realize my football potential because I was, you know, that's just a terrible example. I like how being considerate kept you from the NFL. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was the reason. Yeah, that's the only reason. You know, otherwise I would be... Uh, <laughs> I'd be uh, I'm in Cowboys right now or something. Exactly, yeah. That's, that's the only reason. I'd be Tom Brady. But the same applies for now is I try to think what false worries or boundaries am I trying to accommodate other people at my detriment and when I'm realizing like I'm putting a lot on the line for this, but what is the worst that could happen that in the future I'll be like, that was stupid to have not have done something because of this fear. You know, if I look back on, on high school for the football example, and I'd be like, the worst thing that would have happened is that kid didn't like you. And you potentially could have had all this, you know, it, right. it, the Tom Brady future that I yeah. could have had. Um, I don't want that same thing to be like, 
the worst thing that could happen was these things didn't work out. Well, that doesn't even matter anymore. That kid is in prison and he, who cares if he likes it? you don't. The potential you, pros yeah. like far outweigh the cons of like letting that really hinder you, you know? Yeah. So really just identifying things that hold me back. Are they truly a real risk that I'll care about later? Mm -hmm. And if not, don't let that hold me back. Now, I do want to change gears. I know your older sister, Jackie, has autism, which was one of the driving motivators for Lexington Life Academy. How has that organization evolved since the inception in 2009? Man, it, it has evolved beyond my wildest dreams because it started out as a passion project for her. You know, um, we did a lot of services for her and her, you know, friends in this sphere of services um, you know, my parents for a long time. And then me, when I turned 18, I tried to provide services for her as well that I'm like, I kind of got a glimpse into how other organizations ran. And I'm like this. And so when, you know, when you're working with government funds or contracts where the budgets aren't so heavy, where you have the luxury of being able to pay the highest wages to find the best talented staff or, you know, um, equipment, facilities, upkeep, all these things. The ones that suffer are the ones who this was all meant to be for anyway. Yeah. And so I was like, challenge accepted. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can do, I can do that better. And it took about a year and a half to get a contract with the state of Arizona to start providing these same services for her and some of her close friends and, and some of the other friends that I had developed in that world as well. Um, so then I was just kind of like challenge accepted. It took about a year and a half <clears throat> to get a contract with the state of Arizona, but because we didn't have to live off of the margins, you know, with, I had other ventures that were providing me a, a good income. I could put everything back into this contract for, Hey, I need, I want to hire people at a higher rate so that we can have the top pick of, of the staff that will do this type of service. And word started to spread. You know, we, we showed that we cared so much about our, our members that we were not making money because we were spending money on outings. We were spending money on, you know, fun equipment and, and, experiences for them to have that they don't get other places we just blew up so yeah. we started providing then not only in-home services we started providing in in center services so then we had to buy our first facility and uh from there we started adding adult programs and then ultimately school facilities and programs and then into outpatient clinics for therapies and mental health behavior coaching and transportation and of course all of a sudden because we were occupying a ton of commercial real estate i started a real estate brokerage and property management company and um from there i learned so many different tricks with real estate and taxes and all these things we started a kind of a wealth management firm to help people mitigate their tax liability through a lot of different real estate techniques to not only save on taxes, but make a killing in real estate because commercial real estate, if you also can control your operating businesses in the commercial properties, you're, you're making money off of fake money. Yeah. 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 Off of yourself, your own value, your own, your own lease. And so kept spiraling that into that. And, uh, now here we are. <laughs> how did how did the pandemic affect the momentum? Because I feel um, the the what I'd heard was 100 locations nationwide by 2020, and then obviously with what happened with COVID, did that halt things at all? A lot, because we not only our operation Arizona was pretty good. Mm -hmm. Like with um, for a while, they were like, no, you, you can't have any in person stuff. You had to do a lot of teletherapy, a lot of whatever. But then ultimately Arizona was able to open back up, for, but so many other states weren't. And we were, now we're in Utah, but we were previously in discussions with Texas and um, 
you know, Virginia was one that was getting pretty serious. And a lot of these different states were just unsure of, so then we pulled back and it was like, well, let's figure out if we we're even gonna have a country <laughs> before we start trying to open up more schools. Um, and so speaking of knowing that if we have a country, I hated that I didn't know anything about politics. Like I knew enough to be the average Facebook frustrated poster, you know, of like, oh, it shouldn't be like this, but nothing on how to actually hold representatives accountable, hold people who are making these decisions to close down my businesses and other people's businesses accountable. And so I was like, luckily I'm in a position business-wise that I can have it turned over to some good controllers and I just need to go learn. So I just dived in deep with um, the party that I felt like I recognized myself most aligned with, which was the Republican party and going to a lot of their common meetings and common, you know, conferences and seminars and learning, okay, this is more what I align with, but they're not solving anything. Like you, I, I agree that our, our viewpoints align on so much, but our execution is completely different. And so realizing that not only could I myself not influence so much inside of that, you know, um, arena, if I'm not going to go be a full-time politician, which I'm not, and realizing that they're not the ones that can really make change anyway, it's the, for better or worse, it's the people who control the purse strings that control the puppets and who are the politicians and that sounds gross. Everybody uses that sound bite, but it's true in the sense that in a capitalist economy, you know, big businesses is, businesses is really what's kind of if you are writing big campaign checks to these politicians, there's a reason yeah. and they have to, if they want to stay in office, they have to scratch some backs to have the money to run for the next campaign. So I realized I'm going to focus on what I do best growing businesses and I am going to help as many good people, trustworthy people. They can completely disagree with me on, you know, issues on what I, I disagree with a lot of my Republican uh, party colleagues about social issues and a lot of different whatever. But if they're a truly a good transparent you know, sympathetic, empathetic, but also um, fiscally responsible individual. I want them to have as much money as I can help them get yeah. so that they can then use their money for good. When I started my PAC, you know, my political action committee, it was insane how many more politicians all of a sudden are your best friends and are like, hey, well, you know, what do you need? Well, you know, because you have the purse strings. So, very much wanting to get out of the, they call it the swamp uh, for a reason, because you just feel dirty being in there um, and being on the outside, just being like, you showed your true colors. You act like, or you, you, it seems like you believe that nobody's watching how you vote, watching how you interact, but I've now created enough eyes to not let people get away with that anymore. And ultimately we're going to have to primary you out and you know, we're going to make sure that uh, the generals go the way we need them to go. It, there just hasn't been nearly enough oversight by people, good people with enough money to actually make those changes. They've been kind of turned over to people who have the time, which usually isn't hardworking, small business Americans, you know, they're busy. The people who grow businesses and are honest and, and working hard rarely have the time to go review all of these politicians' record histories and, and interactions when they're the ones that are being the most affected by their decisions. So I kind of want to help change that. And I'm bummed that President Rogers is no... <laughs> yeah, no never... It's got a good ring to it, but... I agree, you know, I agree, but... <laughs> yeah. they on, get anything done 
Right. And that's why I like that the note of, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you had several self-financed, um, you know, meetings where you were trying to really kind of manipulate how people see the term constitutionalists, you know, in that same vein of education. Tell me about why you did that, because I, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that was my kind of my uh, induction into the political world. Didn't know where to start. I didn't I didn't even this is going to sound terrible. I didn't know the structure of our business, uh, of our government, which is a business, <laughs> our, our government where it's like, okay, if I'm upset about our senator, one, how can I potentially do something about it? And two, why am I upset at a senator? What are their powers that potentially are even affecting me? Oh, no, I should actually be upset more about my local mayor yeah. than a senator. And because so many people only vote once every four years because they think the president of the United States is the end all be all decision maker. We're our local mayor originally is supposed to have more power over our daily lives or influence than the president of the United States. But that seems to have completely flipped in people's understandings. And so they don't really even care about the local government anymore because it's just kind of like, Oh, who cares? No, no, no. They're the ones that are That's making change in your daily yeah. lives. <laughs> and so I, because I didn't know this, I was pretty sure that a lot of my same age group friends didn't know this either. So I started the constitutionalists, which was a Facebook group. And so I started the constitutionalists, which was a Facebook group um, of ignorant people who wanted to learn more and were able to have healthy discussion and debate on current issues and history and Perspectives. What I don't like is now how all of a sudden the Constitution or Patriot or you know constitutionalists have somehow or even freedom has now become words associated with like microaggression, right wing. Yeah. I'm like, those are three words that I would have thought would have been you know a patriot, um, Constitution, and freedom. Like I would have thought that could be universally cheered. So maybe I'll have to come up with a different name for the Facebook group. But what, <laughs> what, it, what its original intention was, was to be like, who doesn't understand the Constitution? Let's change that. Come be a part of these weekly um, kind of group studies where I have some people from different um, backgrounds who usually are very conservative leaning. I wanted to find a lot more liberal leaning people to come in and discuss too but i kind of immediately went deep into personal travels and so i wasn't able to host those weekly events as much before i could bring in liberal leaning the more diverse crowd might, as yeah. one would say but there's that consistent theme of education education education, you know. education and that's the thing is we can all debate and we can all have healthy, hopefully one day, <laughs> have converse, you know, open dialogue again when people at least are educated enough to know what they're talking about. Because yeah. when I'm on, uh, you know, pre-2020, when I didn't even know how to hold my, you know, state representative accountable for anything, I would just go on Facebook and argue to argue thinking I knew <laughs> what I was talking about. And it had no, so, and so I'm like, what are, and that's, unfortunately the majority of the conversations out there. Yeah. Um, so if we, if I can change one thing and just help everybody get educated on what the actual structure of the government, why it was built that way. And that's where the, the, um, controversy starts. Cause there's like, well, it was built in a very tough, tough slave way, oriented. slave oriented. Yeah. And I totally get that. They're like, well, yeah, it was, it was structurally engineered. That was very, favorable to certain groups. And so I totally understand all of these different aspects, but if we can at least look that says this structure, this American experiment has produced the most, you know, prosperity that the world has ever seen, um, through unfortunate, I mean, if we can just agree on that part, then we can say, okay, we need to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Sure. You know, yeah, it has a lot of crap that was embedded and we need to dust it off. We need to make sure that we protect at least what has had proven success. 
which was the constitution. I mean, it has, it has, um, weathered some battles, you know, the constant over, especially right now, you know, everybody's trying to change everything about it. But if we can agree that it needs to be protected, but we do need to go in and identify these things that are, um, giving favorable circumstances to one group over another. Absolutely. Um, but we're unable to actually even get to the root cause because everybody's so quick to argue, argue and, and you're wrong or you're racist or you're ignorant and you're stupid. It's like all these things, education, true education, not, not propaganda education or social media education, real education that sh- explains both sides is what can be a potential solution. And to bring that back to LLA with education, I was curious if you could run me through the emotions you felt watching your sister and her husband Drew get married in 2021. Yeah, um, that is kind of funny in the sense that, so she was always our poster child and she still is for every service we kept adding to Lexington. You know, um, she, I guess I should also, she really wants to participate and experience everything that her siblings or her friends experience. Understandably, every human being should experience everything else that everybody else is able to. I don't think she quite understood the aftermath of being married. Like for example, like, yeah, the wedding is cool saying that you got married and all these things, but then you have to live with that person and you have to, so it seemed like right when they got married, it was kind of like, Oh, okay, it's over. Like, so (laughs) it it was a very short lived marriage, but it was really cool to have our poster child of Lexington experience something that is a milestone in life. And, uh, be able to show that no matter your disabilities or your um, struggles, there is a scenario that you can always experience things that you want to experience that are good in life. And, and those can't, those shouldn't be reserved for one group or another. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And she was able to prove that show that. Um, I just wish there was a little bit more uh, (laughs) long, long, long term thinking. Oh man. But, well, you know, experiencing marriage and divorce, that's all. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> that's she, an experience. that's a good point. She's experienced what I haven't experienced yet, you know? So well done. You're ahead of the game. Now, I don't know. This might be more of a reiteration, but you said in 2016 that you want to revolutionize formal education. Um, now, we've talked about politics a little bit. I was curious if you could break down some of the bigger problems in the current academic system in America. You know, I would be a complete... BSer, if I tried to say that I had all the answers of how formal education, curriculum wise or instruction wise, can immediately better. But what I do know is public education, if you have one option for something, there's very limited need or desire to evolve and you know, innovate and the system gets complacent. It's like, what, what else are you going to do? What, you have no other reason. So there's no reason for us to compete uh, and, and be, have a better product. So I'm a very big advocate for school choice, which some people will say, well, that's actually terrible for public schools because then everybody would leave public schools and go to these things. If you're wanting to revolutionize public schools, you're, you know, you're killing them. I'm saying, well, that's a big tell then if everybody's going to leave, um, let me, let's figure out then if that's the case where everybody, if we have school choice and everybody chooses to leave, how do we make it competitive, competitive enough for them to come back? And I, that's where I would say, I don't have all of the expertise of solutions yet necessarily. Yeah. yeah. I I don't want to BS that I have those, but I do know that we have amazing educators who could answer those things and come up with ideas and brainstorms that, uh, for example, I'm more of a hands-on learner, a more of a um, project learner than a institutional lecture. Visual or yeah. audio, like looking at a PowerPoint yeah. doesn't really hit the same as get a kinesthetic approach. At yeah. least yeah. for me, some people are great <laughs> at it. They can just take notes and they can, they can uh, 
you know, just insert and, and um, download all that knowledge. I, I can't, and I have learned a lot of people are like me in that sense. So if we can come up with these solutions on how to do that, where public schools become, even if there's options all around, you know, private schools, charter schools, whatever, people still choose to go to public schools, then we know that we're doing something right. Yeah. But it's, I feel like it's this constant battle of, no, no, we can't have uh, private schools or charter schools becoming come on the scene because then everybody will leave public schools. That is, and so that's where the fight is, is no longer having these other options. That shouldn't be the fight. The fight should be, how do we make public schools be a decision people would make amongst right when you have five things in front of me go with public school and i think like that's where the negative connotation with competition comes in because it's like it's keeping it competitive again for the sake of growth and for the sake of of you know i have the best product versus you guys yeah and control and uh we'll see if that happens (laughs) yeah i would love it And, and and honestly i don't think some people think government and private sectors are always one or the other I've learned just through my schools and my outpatient clinics and stuff, we have a contract with the state to do the best we can with the funds we're given because now there's competitors like of mine. We have to make sure that we spread the dollar as efficiently as possible and as um, innovatively as we can to provide the best product for this. You know, we need to do more of that with the government, not such a divide thing. It's like, public schools and i guess this is like well then it's a private school but if we had more um involvement of a private sector with the government it is not a bad thing people think oh that's corrupt and only certain companies would be able to have those you know all those things are true if left unchecked like so to me, when I think of why government doesn't change is it's, it's a lot of work to always be evolving and always be checking and balancing, checking and balancing, you know, is, we got to make sure that it's not being corrupt, but we got to make sure that the opportunities are still happening and being offered. People get lazy. And the easiest option is what they're going to pick and human nature, yeah. you know, you're going to take the easiest <laughs> option. We need to, if we're going to remove options, we need to remove the option of complacency. All right. Now, I was curious about some of the other businesses that I haven't heard as much about. I wanted some updates, maybe some, you know, current status <laughs> on them. First of which being Cinema Lanes. I know that the entertainment uh, interest is there, and I was curious what the progress is on that. You and so many of the residents of Sholo, Arizona. That is, that was, <laughs> and it still is the plan, but unfortunately, we bought the property, we bought the, the lot, and we were you know, several hundreds of thousands of dollars into um, architect planning, drawing, civil engineers, all these great things, getting ready to solidify the deal. 2020 happens. Not only does, um, you know, the builder and all that stuff and and lenders in general be like, uh, this isn't the time to try. The whole movie theater industry, anything in doors was like are we ever going to be able to get back yeah. into door and so a, trying to build a theater from ground up wasn't really the most financially <laughs> smart thing to to do and so that's been on hold we just started um revisiting it uh and now it's it's right across the sh- the highway of Sholo airport and it is a big undertaking so yeah. now that we're trying to recover it and get it going again it's it's kind of lost its um the luster to some extent yeah yeah especially well with streaming i mean over the last couple years that's exploded and i feel as a businessman you're trying to think okay well how the hell can i pivot to get people back in do you have an answer for that not yet and until i do (laughs) it's kind of hard to pull the trigger yeah so we're but what was really cool about it and why i would probably still love to move forward with it is it is in the same complex as our school yeah. as within individuals with autism. 
And so what's really cool is to be able to not only provide them a venue to go to during summers to, cause it's like arcades, bowling, laser tag, all those additional cool activities. Um, it is an employer for yeah. the ones that graduate and they want it to do e like easier things to get into the work world. Um, you know, custodian, ticket taking, uh, redemption, janitorial, like all these different cool things were like, wow, we can, you know, kind of that whole model of synergies. Yeah, yeah. It just falls into itself. So that would still be a, a big desire. Um, but with everything we're now focusing on with UFL and I, I think it's going to be a couple years before I can kind of take on a new industry venture for sure, but it's still a near and dear <laughs> desire. And that definitely flows into falafel, the waffle themed restaurant in Mesa. Um, I'm bummed that they, I didn't see him at UFL one. I'm not oh, going to lie. <laughs> I, and, and that's more of a personal selfish desire. I don't know if you've ever been to Bruxy. I think, my wife and I, it was like our go-to place in Vegas, but they had a couple other locations around the country. I don't know where, but um, it closed down in, in 2020 as well. It was right across from the Park MGM in uh, Vegas. And we would just, because we would just, that's where we would stay is, the, is at the park. We'd walk over for breakfast. We'd walk over for lunch. <laughs> we'd walk over for dinner. It was just so good. And so I actually went and talked to them and I was like, I want, to franchise. I, I have a bunch of commercial real estate property. I can put this into some great locations. I want it in my house. Like what, what, what can, <laughs> like, we what do, can I do to get this? <laughs> and then they were just like, uh, you know, we're, we're just not going to, we, we're not wanting to franchise. And I was like, uh, You're like well, well, I'll make my own. I'm going to make my own. <laughs> and so the general manager at that location heard me say that, or at least who I was, cause I was picking his brain on some things and he was like, I'll move to Arizona. So we were talking about creating falafel and this was, you know, 2019, 2018 and 2019, because of course, as those things were starting to get made, COVID shut down that location at, uh, in Vegas is no longer there. So that was sad. Wow. Now it's just, it's heartbreaking as we walk by there every day. We're like, There's a waffle themed hole in your heart. Yeah. Now. yeah. I'm like, I just don't feel complete when I'm there. I'm like, it's not even <laughs> worth going to Vegas anymore. No. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, the last one <clears throat> I thought was, was one of the more interesting ones. It was Clout Hub, which was billed as America's social media platform. I know that there was a lot of people that were tied into it, uh, but I can't find their page. I'm not sure if it exists anymore. I know. Um, you know, I am the largest investor into it. And unfortunately the CEO had a stroke, um, like four months ago and leading up to it, you know, we had so many different ideas on how to blow it up, how to make it a legit platform, not just as a, you know, free speech censorship, um, safety net, uh, an option to jump to, but as a legitimate option that people would want to use for their live streams. We, we, st we streamed freedom fight night one and freedom fight night two on it and three. No free. Yeah. I don't know. Definitely the first two freedom fight nights. And it was so cool to bring a whole new genre to the platform. And as we were getting things going for, um, entertainment, bringing sports to it and all these things. Unfortunately, the, the CEO suffered some health battles and I embarrassingly don't know the status as a investor. I need to, <laughs> but as a, uh, operator of a lot of other businesses too. I, I've not had the time to can't keep tabs on everything. Know. You know what I mean? Like that's, I think what blows me away the most is we talked a little bit about the work life balance, but even the balance within the work is difficult. And so the question I have for you is about the teams that you have at each of these businesses. How do you vet, how do you get the best people to make sure that like you don't know on a day to day, but you have that trust in the team to get it done? If there's one thing that I probably can say that I have a higher skill set at like I, I I'm very aware of my weaknesses and I would never be one to say I'm smarter than certain or that I have a special 
But there's one thing that I could be a little bit cocky about, and it is finding great team members. I have been so blessed at the partners that I've had through Lexington, through um, my real estate companies, and through uh, now United Fight League. One of the things that I think they attract to me about is because I truly, 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 sincerely want win-wins. And how I do that is by always making sure that I have a partner that has equity in the company. Even if it's if it's a small amount of equity at the beginning as sweat equity, I need them to look at whatever venture we're doing together as their baby because you treat something very differently that you own compared to something that you collect a check from or that you rent or that you whatever. And so being able to have learned that up to the UFL made the decision to make UFL a corporation that is a shareholder model that fighters are shareholders has really poised us to be, I think a disrupting model for this industry because fighters are now like not having to be told, Hey, you know, look presentable, you know, where, where, where the UFL logo you know, where, you know, hold, be proud of the energy drink. Like, they're not like, well, what's in it for me? You know, blah, blah, blah. they're like, this is my company. Like, I, I want this to succeed. And I think that is going to show so much more results and success than anything else we're doing. And I think, again, it's the direct answer of like with the UFC, the fighters don't get the rock shoes, the, you know, Reebok kits, the monsters. But like, again, every sale of F3, every tracksuit that's purchased goes directly into the pockets of the fighters, exactly. which is, is pretty ridiculous. I love that. Yeah. Cause I mean, the people who don't love that, it, it speaks, yeah. you know, it's like, you don't, you know, Say no more. I get I get who I'm working with now. Yeah, you're like I don't have anything to say because you don't. Um, you're like, not excited about that. Exactly. Your issues with me don't pertain to what this is. Your issues are tangential at best. Exactly. You know? Now I did want to talk about because everything's blossoming right now. The, the snowball is gaining a lot of momentum. But I wanted to take a look at some of the hardships and lows. Now there was a real estate deal which snowballed into a plethora of other things in 2017, as you put it, being the worst year of your life. Um, now understanding a lot of it's <laughs> confidential. Uh, I was curious when you look back with the knowledge that you have now was 2017 preventable. Probably, um, you know, like I was saying, I think before we were recording, I don't have a lot of degrees or certificates or things to show like, here's my knowledge or here's, here's what I know how to do based on you know, some professors saying I can, what I do have is some big examples of huge learning <laughs> curves and experiences that I can say, I am never going to do that again. Yeah. And hopefully that provides just as much comfort in a team or a partner or potential investors that, you know, degree or not, he knows not to over leverage or count chickens before they hatch or go into um, real estate deals that's not completely dialed up from A to Z um, because that's exactly what happened. We, from 2009 or 2006, from my carpet cleaning business all the way up through this point, I was kind of, um, probably incorrectly goggled thinking that I could do no wrong. I'm so smart in business. I, everything I'm touching turns to gold. It just succeeds, it succeeds, blah, 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 blah. And I now would always partner with somebody who has some losses on their belts and somebody who's always succeeded because at first I wore that as a badge of honor. I was like, I, look at all these businesses that I started that have succeeded. Um, but look at this one that didn't and what did you learn from it? And what I learned from it was I had too many things reliant on this deal succeeding that if it didn't succeed, it crumbles everything else. Yeah. And so being able to have way better handles on deals that can 
win or fail on their own is paramount. And I'm always going to make sure that I'm not, I'm not jeopardizing anything else that we've, you know, won to be hindered by something that is, is unknown. So for example, that one, um, man, I wouldn't wish that experience upon my worst enemy. I was a ghost for probably a year, you know, a ghost of a partner, um, a ghost husband, father. And it was literally, how am I going to get out of this legal battle, still have my operating businesses operate under the faith, uh, somehow believing that I'm going to be able to get us out of this. So keep working. Cause you guys are going to still have paychecks, you know, and not have that cause culture when you, when a culture is killed, it is like impossible to re pump up. And the culture is what create keeps, um, members happy, students happy, staff happy. And if they're not happy, they're gone. And if they're gone, revenue has gone. And so then you have less revenue to solve these legal battles with. And so just kind of always trying to keep these, these things going that year, I was a ghost. And so miracles happen. This is actually where I have a big testimony and tithing. Now, one of the things that I've learned in my church, but <laughs> it doesn't have to be just LDS tithing. I, if I was on a podcast with Joe Rogan, I'd talk about the simulation that I believe we're on. <laughs> I feel like tithing is like a cheat code in the, in our simulation. You know, have, have you seen free guy? Yeah. So I feel like if people are beggars on the street or whatever, I know they're real people, but I can kind of look at them and be like, what if this is a NPC that when you give money to them, it's a like, bing and you get like, it's you level karma, up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you get karma. And so I believe there's some truth to this because when that was happening in 2017 um, or end of 2016, I was losing everything. And I was like, God, I need help. I don't know what to be doing. I was like, I know I haven't been the best tithe uh, payer. I commit to paying tithing on everything that I gain. If you can help me come out, you know, come out of this. And... I didn't have any money really to pay myself, but I paid myself exactly what I needed for the bare minimum of just my bills. Um, and so paying 10% of that was terrifying, but just doing it every time uh, I paid myself every two weeks, like I, 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 I was very religious about it. You know, I was uh, structured and then miracle after miracle after miracle started happening where I had a few assets in commercial real estate that in commercial real estate, it's really hard to sell quickly, right. <laughs> especially at listing price. And in commercial real estate, the value of the building is based on the tenants leases and their financial solvency. You know, is it a strong yeah. tenant paying that lease and how much is that lease worth? So to be in my, my most financial turmoil, in these properties, trying to get full market value and sell within, you know, a year was like, yeah, right. Yeah. And, and that was, this would be my only way to solve this legal settlement on this thing. Within a month, all three of my commercial assets sold to three different buyers. Wow. Like I get chill. And so I have never missed tithing. Ever again. Like, I, board, yeah. like when they, I never understood what they meant when they said like a God fearing person, you know, yeah. this is now I get it. Like when I get money paid to me, I'm like, oh, oh, tithing, you know, like I'm like God fearing priority. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, pay my partner, pay my partner first, you know? It, 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 so that's what happened is I over leveraged, got into a big deal. This was like a $50 million real estate deal that had to go perfectly right when some um, inevitable hiccups happened that I just never had been through or expected and some people kind of taking advantage of those um, hurdles made everything fall apart. That's what had happened, but then being able to have these miracles allow me the liquidity to put those to bed and pretty much start from a 
a square, a square yeah. one, yeah. which was heartbreaking yeah. because I felt like I'd worked so hard to get to step three, <laughs> you know, I'm like, Oh no, I'm back one. At least I didn't have to start with a bankruptcy under my right. belt. You know, that would have been 10 times worse. And so counting my amazing blessings that I was able to start from square one. And now we are at step 10. So not only have I been able to make back where I was, I'm able to be up here with so much more um, discipline. Yeah. Well. yeah. And if I hadn't had that happen here, maybe I'd be making those same decisions up here at a way bigger magnitude risk that I wouldn't be able to ever come back from like I was with this. So very grateful for those lessons and uh, being way more disciplined with my um, strategies and uh, yeah, the, the future is bright. You know, I was gonna say when I pulled into the parking lot, I did see you give a homeless guy 10 grand and I was, I was confused, but I understand why now. <laughs> yeah, I, was like, I was like, level up, level up. <laughs> I am curious though, on the, the piggyback of that topic, how do you view success and failure these days? Because I think back then failure wasn't seen with such um, negative connotations, right? Thomas Edison trying thousands of times to create the light bulb. Whereas these days, I feel if you take one wrong turn, one big failure, you're kind of condemned and people don't give you chances anymore. Agreed. That bankruptcy point by itself is um, a good... You hear, you know, Donald Trump's or whatever that, oh, they went bankrupt three times and they still had a chance. Mm -hmm. That is very much a thing of the past. You're, you're absolutely right that one failure is, is a blemish forever. I don't know how to change that in the society. The macro scheme of things, but yeah. But internally, I don't look at those as failure. Like I said, as terrible as it was, it's weird to say back is that was a learning experience that I needed to learn then. Otherwise I, if I would have learned it later, I wouldn't have been able to recover. Failure is when you let it completely, um, halt the tracks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what, what do they say? Fail, failure is stopping. Yeah. And I haven't, I wanted to stop in 2017 for sure. I wanted to stay in my bed and curl up in a fetal position and just cry all day but not stopping is so rewarding and worth it and that's so then all those other things failure isn't final and I'm, I'll misquote it but in 2016 you said something to the effect of falling forward correct I believe that was the quote yes, yes that is ironically the name of my book that yeah. I wrote and I guess it did, I feel like I could write a whole second edition of that because I learned so much more right after that book, but that encompasses everything that we just said. It is learning from these um, terrible hurdles, but falling in a way that when you get back up, you're actually further ahead than when you hadn't fallen. So it's kind of, it's kind of a cheesy, philo, philo, you know, maybe trying to sound more philosophical than I <laughs> probably should, but it just, in, to me, it's a, it's a good illustration of what I'm trying to say is falling down is only a bad thing if you don't get back up. But when you get back up, ironically, you're in a different position than you were when you yeah. fell, and it, which could be a good <laughs> I thought it was funny how it was Harrison Rogers. <laughs> you know what I mean on the quote? <laughs> That's what my dad said too. He's like, he was all, oh, you know, the, the great philosopher, Harrison <laughs> Rogers. <laughs> what douchebag quotes himself, you know? <laughs> this guy. No, that was funny. One of the last things I'll ask before we get into UFL 2 and some expectations for that is, who is your favorite mixed martial artist of all time? Whoa, um, you know, having met some of the legends, it would be hard to say either any of their names now because I don't want any of them to feel like, wait, what? Right, yeah, why is Harrison yeah. choosing? Yeah. But, but, all of, yeah. 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 but all of them were absolutely heroes and stars, trailblazers in my life that I admired, but I wouldn't say he's, he was the best mixed martial arts because, but he brought jujitsu. So meeting Hoist Gracie this 
third three weekends ago at the Bellator reunion of yeah. you know Fedor. He, I would say he was probably my, just because he changed it. He changed the entire outlook on fighting where he, you know, he, he, he's going to his back. What the, oh, he broke his arm. You know what I mean? It's just a totally different, um, that I respect that somebody able to come in and completely leave their mark on an entire sport is unsurprising that you chose a disruptor. <laughs> yeah, there we go. For sure. All right. Harrison, May 13th, some trouble in Tennessee, UFL 2 in Memphis. What can we expect? As great as UFL 1 was, which I am super grateful how great it was, Memphis is going to be even better because it is now returning Rampage to his hometown, you know, his roots where he is able he's always wanted to circle back there. I think he was going to fight Rashad Evans there before he then went to uh, film a team. And so it's near and dear for him, which makes it near and dear for me, but it's also our first big event outside of Arizona that is going to test our scalability. You know, I love the momentum we have here in Arizona, but is it going to translate into country cross country growth? I think it will, and we are going to just continue to grow and build, and those that see the vision follow along and uh, see what Memphis has to to provide that we know is going to be amazing, but you guys are just going to <laughs> you have to find watch. out. Yeah. Is yeah. that on Rumble again? It is. It is. There it we is. go. And, and this one is, um, you know, we're learning that as much as we love the pay-per-view a version we absolutely want this to be enjoyed by everybody and so many people kind of balk at ufc's they keep upping the price of pay-per-view on top of the espn plus it's it's, yeah. it's like you know what if we're already disrupting stuff let's just go free you know so we're gonna go with a platform that wants our content that uh, maybe we can monetize in a different way than pay-per-view which is the plan but we want our audience to not be limited by a pay-per-view i love it expect the unexpected harrison rogers thank you so much for the time ufl2 on may 13th can't wait to see it in memphis